Welcome Beat Kaufmann on this topic, value of echocardiography in chronic dyspnea. Thank you very much. Um, so what is the value of echocardiography in chronic dyspnea, which lasts longer than one month, is mostly caused by cardiac or pulmonary problems, and is multifactorial in up to one third of patients. Now, before we go into echocardiography, let's just look at the value of history, physical exam, and chest x-ray. This is a pretty old study from a pneumology practice, so it may not reflect overall patients with chronic dyspnea, but what you can see is that overall, with just history, physical exam, and chest x-ray, a correct diagnosis can be made in over two-thirds of the patients. This is more if you're looking at the most frequent diseases and less if the diseases are less common. Now, yes, you can make the diagnosis in two-thirds of the patient, but that is obviously not enough. You want to diagnose all of them correctly. And sometimes you also need more information about the disease severity or other things. So what are we looking for? Broadly, we're looking at cardiac problems. We're looking at myocardial diseases, cardiac arrhythmias, pericardial disease, and valvular heart disease. Pulmonary, we're looking at chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, asthma, interstitial lung disease, malignancies, bronchiectasis. And then there are other rare uh, causes of, that, of uh, chronic dyspnea, thromboembolic disease is not that rare, pulmonary hypertension, but a large list of other uh, causes that you need to be aware of. And echocardiography can give you an information mostly on myocardial disease, pericardial disease, and valvular heart disease, which all, broadly speaking, cause heart failure. And it can also help you in the evaluation of thromboembolic disease and pulmonary hypertension. Now, do not forget that before you go for an echo, you need to do complete blood counts, metabolic profiles. It is good, a good idea to have a chest X-ray, an ECG, maybe spirometry and pulse oximetry. And you, you think that that is obvious, but it is not, and this applies to all of us. It's not just the young fellows who sometimes forget about this. I think we all have uh, done the mistake to go for more complex tests and forget the obvious. Now, if you suspect that your patient has a heart failure and after clinical history and physical exam and ECG, you still think so, um, then you can go for further tests. If none of these is present, heart failure is unlikely. Um, and this is from the new uh, ESC guidelines on heart failure. Uh, you can do natriuretic peptides. If they're completely normal, heart failure is unlikely. Uh, if they're elevated, you go for echocardiography. But it is also correct to directly go for an echocardiography, and it is something that is often done in clinical practice. And if you can confirm the heart failure in echocardiography, you also want to know the etiology. Now, one of the most important parameters that we want to look at, obviously, is left ventricular ejection fraction. There are different ways to look at that. Eyeballing is subjective and experience dependent, is not standardized, and has a large variability. Most frequently, we measure left ventricular ejection fraction with the biplane Simpsons method, which is kind of time consuming, has some geometric assumptions, and depends on image quality. We can improve image quality by giving the patient IV contrast, but that needs an IV line, and we still depend on geometric assumptions. In recent years, we've also looked at 3D echocardiography, which even more depends on image quality and has uh, problems in terms of frame rate. Now, look at these two hearts. This is obvious. This is a patient with a severely reduced left ventricular ejection fraction. And this is a healthy uh, individual with a normal left ventricular ejection fraction. So this is easy. Um, but if we look at data, uh, and this is from a large heart failure trial where uh, two observers analyzed the left ventricular ejection fraction of these patients, 
And you can see that overall, there is a very good correlation between the two measurements. But if you look at individual patients, there are large variabilities in how we measure left ventricular ejection fraction. So that is one thing that you need to keep in mind when reading an echo report that states the ejection fraction is 35% or whatever. <clears throat> now, apart from measurement variability, um, left ventricular ejection fraction is the parameter that we most often measure in cardiology, and we tend to think of it as a measure of systolic function. But look at this. This is one parameter ejection fraction that depends on preload, on afterload, on heart rate, and on contractility. This again is a normal patient. He has a normal ejection fraction. He probably has a normal systolic function. This is a patient with a severe mitral regurgitation. If you measure the ejection fraction, it is completely normal. But that does not necessarily mean that the systolic function is normal because the afterload in this patient is reduced by the severe mitral regurgitation. So ejection fraction is not an ideal measure of systolic function. It is what we have most experience in, but there's certainly need for better measures of systolic functions. One of them is strain imaging. Uh, strain looks at myocardial deformation. You have an example here from 3D strain measures. Uh, and what this measures is simply how much does, for example, in the longitudinal direction, the myocardium shorten during systole. And if you look at, this is a study for, where, where, where uh, investigators looked at 60 patients with a normal ejection fraction, and they measure left ventricular and diastolic pressures. Some of them had heart failure. And what you can see is that the left ventricular and diastolic pressure uh, depends on longitudinal peak strain or has a relation with it. And in patients with elevated left ventricular and diastolic pressure, the longitudinal strain, so the longitudinal deformation of the myocardium here, is significantly lower than in those without increased left ventricular and diastolic pressures. So there is more to systolic function than just left ventricular ejection fraction. Now, you can also get heart failure with a normal ejection fraction. If you have diastolic dysfunction, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, you'll hear more about this in the next talk. But for this, you need to have symptoms and signs. You need to have a normal left ventricular ejection fraction. You need to have elevated natriuretic peptides and at least one of these additional criteria. You need to have relevant structural heart disease. This can be left ventricular hypertrophy or a dilated left atrium. And you need to have diastolic dysfunction. Hypertrophy, we measure with different uh, methods. There's the cubed formula where we measure the myocardium at the base of the left ventricle and then calculate left ventricular mass. There are 2D based formulas uh, that measure the dimensions in uh, 2D images. Each of them has their problems. The cube formula here uh, has a 20% correction factor which is simply historical. We don't know whether that applies to newer ultrasound machines as well, which offer a better image quality. The cube formula overestimates mass in basal hypertrophy because this is where you measure and then you extrapolate uh, your measurement for the whole ventricle. In contrast, the 2D-based formulas underestimate mass in basal septal hypertrophy because you measure dimensions in other axes. And overall, we correct mass for body surface area, and this may mask hypertrophy in very obese patients, so you need to keep that in mind. Now, this is an example. This is obviously left ventricular hypertrophy. This is a calculated left ventricular mass of 141 grams per square meter. Now, LA volume is another parameter that you want to look at because it reflects left ventricular filling pressures. Usually we measure that with the 2D biplane Simpsons method. You measure in two 
dimensions and you calculate the LA volume. Normal is a value below 34 milliliters per square meter body surface area. In recent years, we've also used three-dimensional echocardiography to measure left atrial volumes, but we do not have normative data at this time. Diastolic dysfunction you want to look at. This is a large area, and I can't go into all the details, but basically you want to look at left atrial size, at the mitral inflow. This is early velocity of mitral inflow through the mitral valve. And this is late mitral inflow after the atrial contraction. And you also want to look at mitral annular motion. So you look at tissue motion. You have an early diastolic wave and you have a late diastolic wave that in the timing corresponds to those two waves. And you can look at the relation between the velocity of the mitral inflow and the velocity of tissue motion. There's a number of studies that look at the correlation between diastolic dysfunction and these parameters. This is one of them, 43 patients with normal ejection fraction and a diastolic dysfunction confirmed by invasive hemodynamics and 12 control subjects. And you can see that this parameter correlates overall with parameters of diastolic dysfunction that are me measured invasively. However, what you can also appreciate is that there's quite some overlap between normal and abnormal. And this also is reflected in how we uh, interpret these measurements. You can measure average E to E prime. If it's over 14, it suggests diastolic dysfunction. You can measure septal velocities and lateral velocities of the tissue motion. You can also measure pulmonary pressure, which will rise as a reflection of increased left ventricular filling pressures, and you can look at the left atrial volume. If less, of, less than two of these are positive, you probably have normal diastolic dysfunction. If more than two of these are positive, you probably have diastolic dysfunction. But in between, there's an area of indeterminate where you don't know how to interpret this. There are more factors to look at, but this is not uh, is out of the scope of this. But this is due to the overlap in the measurements. Now, we've talked about systolic and diastolic dysfunction, and I've told you that we can also look at the etiology. I'll let you have a look at these four so you can make up your mind what you think you have here. So, this is from a patient with coronary artery disease. You can see a wall motion defect here, and he has reduced systolic function. This is from a patient with hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. You see an increased septum thickness. This is almost three centimeters on the one hand. And what you can also appreciate here is systolic anterior motion of the, mi of the mitral valve. You can see that during systole, it moves towards the outflow tract. And this is a sign of dynamic obstruction in the left ventricular outflow tract. This is left ventricular non-compaction. This may come as a surprise to you. It's a disease that not only exists in Zurich, but also in other parts of the world. Um, you have thinned, compacted myocardium here, and you have a large layer of non-compacted myocardium with recesses. And these patients can go into heart failure over time. And last, you have here an example of cardiac amyloidosis. You see pseudohypertrophy here of the left ventricle, but also of the right ventricle. And in addition, you see increased uh, reflectance of the myocardium. Now, apart from the left ventricle, there's also valvular heart disease that can cause chronic dyspnea, or aortic stenosis is one example. Now, it's not always easy to diagnose severe aortic stenosis. This is a patient in the intensive care unit. You can see that the image quality is not optimal. Um, the ejection fraction is normal, but you can appreciate here that the valve, the aortic valve is thickened. But if you go and measure this, the gradient is not all that high. This is not 
diagnostic of uh, aortic stenosis. So you need to keep in mind that in these patients, if they have dyspnea and you have the impression that this could be aortic stenosis, you don't just go with a normal echo. You need to go after the aortic stenosis until you're either sure that this is not the case of dyspnea or you have made the diagnosis. And in this case, we went on to transesophageal echo. This shows you in a short axis that this uh, aortic valve almost does not open anymore. And if you measure the gradient with TOE, you get to much higher values and you can make the diagnosis of aortic stenosis. And sometimes it's the rare disease that you're looking at. This is a patient with a uh, left ventricular obstruct outflow obstruction. You have a large gradient in the left ventricular outflow tract, but the aortic valve moves normally. And so this patient has got the membrane in the left ventricular outflow tract. So it's a subvalvular aortic stenosis causing his dyspnea. Mitral regurgitation can also be a cause for dyspnea. Uh, you need to distinguish between secondary mitral regurgitation. This is a patient with a large lateral infarction that distorts mitral uh, valve architecture and causes a severe mitral regurgitation. This is a patient with a primary mitral regurgitation with a prolapse of the posterior valve and a flay leaflet and that causes mitral regurgitation. Pericardial constriction is another um, <clears throat> cause for uh, chronic dyspnea. This is a patient that has pericardial constriction, elevated central venous pressure. You can see that here. This is the inferior vena cava, dilated and does not move with uh, respiration. Here you can see the effects of the uh, non-compliant pericardium. If the patient uh, breathes, more backflow comes to the right side of the heart, and because the pericardial space cannot accommodate for this increased volume, the intraventricular septum shifts towards the left ventricle during inspiration. And that also influences blood flow. On the left side, you can see respiratory variability of mitral inflow, and you can see the same in the hepatic veins. And you can use those parameters to diagnose pericardial constriction. This is from the Mayo Clinic, 130 patients with surgically, surgically confirmed pericardial constriction and 30 controls. Blinded analysis of echocardiographic data. And you can see that uh, my percent change in mitral E velocity or hepatic vein uh, velocity changes can detect pericardial constriction. Sensitivities range in the 80 percentage. Now last, chronic thromboembolic disease and pulmonary hypertension. Uh, echocardiography may be of a value there. Here you can see a patient with chronic thromboembolic disease. The right ventricle is dilated and you have septal flattening during systole of the uh, interventricular septum. Uh, pulmonary artery hypertension looks pretty much the same. Um, you can see a dilated right ventricle, dilate, dilated right atrium, and you measure high pulmonary artery pressures. So in summary, um, echocardiography in chronic dyspnea is the first line diagnostic imaging test for detecting myocardial disease, valvular heart disease, and pericardial disease. It may aid in the diagnosis of thromboembolic disease and pulmonary artery hypertension, but always be aware you need to do those diagnostic tests in the clinical context. Thank you for your attention.